Hey guys, how's it going? It's me, Josh Halter, owner and founder of The Bio Dude. Today, we have a really ex exciting build for you. You can come visit my store at The Bio Dude Tucson, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Visit my website, Instagram, YouTube, the whole nine yards. And I'm Mariah Healy, the author and owner behind Reptophiles.com, where better reptile care begins. Awesome. Today, we are really excited to build this 24 by 18 by 18 Exoterra that you see here for a little rosy boa. So, I'm really excited to show you guys. This little beauty actually belongs to an employee of mine. Her name is Tiffany. And Tiffany being so brilliant, which she is, but came up with a, with a great name for this snake. And her name is, you guessed it, Rosie. So... These are a great beginner species as far as snakes are concerned. They're very docile and they are, you know, United States natives. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. The uh, southwestern U.S. and uh, northern Mexico, if I remember correctly. Pretty cool. And a lot of times you can find them, you know, in their burrows and then at night they'll come out to hunt and things like that. So in the wild, they'll typically eat like... You know, small rodents, um, I'm assuming, you know, small lizards, if they can catch them. Honestly, mm -hmm. anything that comes across their path that doesn't require a lot of, you know, energy, they'll go, they'll go right, right for it. But of all the, of all the snakes, you know, to start with, these are one of the best. So being boas, they are new world snakes, which means they're live bearers, mm -hmm. which is really, really cool. So if you breed them and you have a pair, you can wake up one morning and there'll be a bunch of little babies mm -hmm. in the enclosure, which I've seen that with Kenyan sand boas, which is freaking adorable, but I've never seen it with the rosies. Now, there's a couple different varieties of genetic mutations of the of the rosies, correct? Or is it, because from what I've seen, they, I've seen like other ones that um, almost look, that are, almost have that almost, Almost look albino, but they're not albino. Is it yeah. xanthic or something like that? I can't remember. I'm not. Uh, I'm not great with morphs, honestly. But I do know that. Yeah, there are morph breeders. There is okay. a small morph breeding community for rosy boas, and um, they actually they have a lot of uh, different localities. And so, a rosy That's boa it. from the, New Mexico all the different will localities. look very different from a rosy boa from say California. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean that that makes perfect sense. Yeah, one of my favorite localities. It's not so much a specific locality as a specific phenotype, but they're tan with black stripes instead of this oh, uh, beige That would be really cool. Red. And oh, I mean, this is gorgeous, but for me, I like the black. Look at this, this thing is so cute. All right, mm -hmm. let's go in here now. Go on in here. So this is just our little temporary holding container while we build her brand new terrarium. Well, I mean, we're, we're calling it a her. We're not exactly sure what the sex is. What's that show where they like pimp out a house? It's, uh, Ribs? No, I'm not. I'm not sure. I feel like we're in one of those uh, redecorating shows. Like, you have been selected as the lucky family to receive a brand new professionally designed house. That's what we're doing today, except for a snake. I like that. So, as you guys know, uh, for a rosy boa, I am going to recommend my Terra Sahara Bioactive Substrate. Um, you know, you could also use your, your own your own at at home mix. You know, for desert, if you if you're able to do that. The most important things when using desert substrate with you know your bioactive especially with snakes it's very important that you are able to keep that top layer dry with the middle and bottom layers relatively moist this can help prevent fungal infections scale rot as well as with those middle and bottom layers help promote shedding respiration and hydration which i always tell you guys is one of the most important parts when it comes to husbandry that we, we need, need to take care of so but I'm always going to recommend my Sahara because I've been using it for years. So, Ryan, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open this 50-pound bag up, and I'm going to dump it in here. And when I dump it, would you like to spread it? Sure. Okay. I'm going to take my ring off here. All right. So, for bioactive in general, uh, especially with desert, you know, we're not going to be using a drainage layer because why would we use a drainage layer if it's really uh, a dry or arid environment? Uh, we do want to use different types of biodegradables to help promote your different breakdown of organic matter to promote healthy soil, uh, sorry, soil processes and other things like that. So again, it's just one of those things that 
Uh, since, since we're not using the drainage layer, you want to make sure to have about at least three inches of depth in the substrate. All right, so Mariah, let's, do you want to go ahead and get this evened out for mm -hmm. me? Sure. Um, or put it however you want to, you know, layer it out. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Honestly, we could leave it almost as it is. We could have an interesting, like, form going okay. on here. Awesome. Some areas that are thicker, some areas that are not. Maybe, oh, you know what we should have done? We should have stuck that cork bark in. We can figure that out later. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'll usually mix in all the biodegradables. Mm -hmm. And then I'll put in the uh, then I'll put in the water dish, and then I'll figure out the cork situation because a lot of people like to figure out well where's my hot side gonna be, mm -hmm. where's my cool side gonna be, you know, and X, Y, and Z. All right, I dig it. That should give us a, a fun shape to work okay. with, hopefully. So with these guys being from a very dry or a dry region, we're not gonna be there's not gonna be a lot of moisture in this terrarium, especially not ambient. Where your the consistency of moisture is going to be is in the middle and bottom layers, like I said before. Mm -hmm. So it's why, so essentially that's what we're gonna be helping to promote with the sphagnum moss. So what I'm thinking I'm gonna do, Mariah, is I'm gonna dump in water to about here okay. to get this, this a little bit soaked, um, but not so soaked like I'm doing like a day gecko terrarium or a tree frog terrarium. Mm -hmm. I'm using a little bit less water. So I used about this much in the bag for the rosy boa. You guys can see how the line goes. So a trick that I learned, which we can try, we can try it out, is I use this for my smaller substrate too. I'll take the bag and I'll turn it. And then I'll just go like this with the water. Shake it up. That's a good idea. Yeah, so that way it helps with uh, moisture spread and also it, you know, works out with uh, with uh, so that way it's, it's not as messy. Uh, and the consistency sure. that I like to have the spag moss be is wet but not dripping for like the desert setups. If it is dripping, 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 then you wanna squeeze it out big time. So that way there's not, there's not near as much water in there. Would you like to do the honors? All right. So you can use, use as much as you want. Typically with my setups, um, I like to dump in like a good amount and then I will thoroughly mix this mm -hmm. from the very top to the very bottom. So, oh really? Yeah, so I do that for a couple reasons. One, this is gonna dry out, mm -hmm. especially on the top. Two, it's going to help aerate your soil from the very top to the very bottom. So Mariah, I'm sure you know this. So what's like, what's the reason we want a really good aerated soil? Well, one, so you don't have fungus start to grow. I mean, bad a little fungus. bit of, yeah, bad fungus yep. or bad bacteria. Yep. Um, usually in an unoxygenated environment, you're going to start getting yep. uh, the undesirables yep. start to grow. Yep. You can you get, get enough um, to mix in, or do you want to mix in the whole bag? Let's try this and see how we feel. Okay, sounds good. So I'll start mixing one end if you want to mix the other. And like I said, I get it all the way down into the bottom and so as another good factor with the spag moss is it breaks down very, very slowly, which is very helpful because it creates microbial hot spots in the soil that your bio shot and your bugs are going to slowly break down. So it's going to keep putting nutrition into your soil little by little while helping creating these microbial nutrition hot spots that are continually energizing your soil, plus helping raise those, those humidity pockets within the soil itself to help, again, with shedding respiration and hydration. Um, honestly, I think with keeping snakes on bio, one of the best things about it, besides that they get the burrow and all that, is they almost always have a clean shed. As, as long as you are making sure that your husbandry is right, you know, there's no eye caps, you know, there's, it's always a nice clean shed. And most of the time, the shed will get eaten by your bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like in my corn snake enclosure over there, shed lasts like two days if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have a well-developed enough uh, cleanup crew in my snake enclosures yet, but uh, I just feed the sheds to my uh, isopod colony. Oh, they go crazy for it. Oh yeah. So how do you feel about this? So we can go to the side here. We got a good amount in there. Do you want to add the rest? Some more. Okay. Awesome. Probably. I mean, you are the bioactive expert. Um, well, I mean, so. well, this is also, you know, um, root thing. So, okay, I like that. That's pretty good. I'm just gonna coat them. This reminds me of the process of making artificial lines. 
You ever done that before? Artificial vines with the rope and then yeah, you dip the it in the black the stuff. And, yeah, mm -hmm. it's very smelly and induces oh, yeah. headaches. I can't stand the smell of I've silicone. always wondered how Exoterra and some of these other companies mass produce it. There has to be some type of machine that they take the wire or the the, the wire that they have to dip it in yeah. something. Like I've always wondered the, how that process works. I'll find out one day because that's what I do. But <laughs> you know, um, I, I always thought that was really interesting. But you gotta be careful with some of that stuff though because if it's plastic based, your crickets can eat it. Oh, and yeah. then it gets into the crickets and then your animals eat it and it gets into the animals. So sometimes you gotta be careful with that stuff. Okay. I think, I'm I think that's pretty, pretty good. Happy with this. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna put this aside and if we need more, we can revisit it. Yeah. All right. So the next thing that I like to do is add in the leaf litter. Now, I, I always tell you guys, I consider the spag moss and the leaf litter, you know, with of course your biological and the processes that we're implementing in the bugs to be the fuel and the car is your substrate. So think of the biodegradables as the fuel that drives the car because without the biodegrad without the biodegradables or the fuel, your, your soil will eventually run out of nutrition to be able to continually function. So this is actually, the type in here is large oak, which, which I, I mean, I really like this stuff. So since mm -hmm. it is like a desert environment, I'm not going to use a lot. Thinking about starting with this much here. And then we can go ahead and mix it in and see and see how we like this with the volume. Does that work for you? Yeah. Um, so when I'm rocking and rolling with the desert or the drier biomes, I'm always going to try to make sure that the leaves are at the very bottom um, or like really thoroughly mixed in just so that way the you know, again, it's the same principle as the sphagnum moss. It's going to slowly break down, provide the organic nutrition for your soil while promoting like the bioactivity really aspect like of it. I think this is perfect. It's not overwhelming. And of course, we're going to have a lot of other resources for the microbiological processes and the bugs. We'll have rocks, we got cork, we got root real plants, we got a bunch of stuff. So, so I think what's next. Let's add in the bio shot of the bugs. Would you do the honors for me? So right. the bio shot, all we're gonna do is we're gonna dump the entire contents of this into the into the soil and mix it. And then we'll bust out the ice pods and the spring all right. bells. That will mix in and it's awesome. This cage, this cage is gonna look really, really good. These bags are not the easiest to open when your hands are already covered in dirt. Oh, pro tip guys, do not like sniff this stuff. Yep. It's pungent. <laughs> yep. It smells organic, right? <laughs> yeah, when I when I got my shipment uh, of my first uh, purchase of BioDude substrate kits, uh, I'm like, I opened the box and I'm like, what is that smell? Yep. Yep. And I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, dirt doesn't smell like this. And this is it's the not the dirt. The dirt. Yeah. So I'm like using my nose and I'm just sniffing around like, is it this? Is it this? And I was at the bio shot and I'm like, of course. Yeah. It's it, going to it be the really sense, concentrated. Though. It makes nutrients. sense. I mean, it's just going to put all that good stuff right in there. All right. Mm -hmm. So the next thing we should add is the bugs. So we just added our microbiological processes. Some archaea bacteria, some mycorrhizal fungi that's going to form a symbiotic relationship with plant roots. Help, help the plants grow, create, you know, um, nutrition while providing a 444 NPK ratio, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, which is good for growth and development of your soil as your plants. So I got some pretty neat little isopods in here. Oh, look at that. These are the orange isopods. So these guys breed really readily. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pay close attention to the population in here. We're going to make sure that we don't overproduce because it can happen, especially with this species, that we can overproduce to the point when we uh, might bother the snake because we're in such a, you know, we're in a closed terrarium. They don't have a way to completely get away. Yeah, and with a terrestrial species too, you're yep. looking at a conflict of territories. Yep. Like, uh, it's not such a problem. I have a ton of powder oranges in my uh, Europlata sicari enclosure, my mossy leaf tailed gecko, but 
she's arboreal so yep. she can get away from them it's no big deal and so i have to at this point i'm learning out the isopods with like pieces of squash Wait, so i can it. shake them into the colony and just be like get out of here morning geckos yep. oh yeah yep all right little boogs let's do this off with ye oh you're much nicer you than me i always just i straight up just don't colonize <laughs> there they the go home this is Mars, and you are the going initial to landing. terraform it. I love it. I love that. Here you go. And then we have the springtails right here. So, so these what are do you the... the charcoal. I'm curious. What's up? Because usually just kind of like shake them in and hope I get them. Oh, you just so mix the charcoal. I just dump all of it in. All right. And then just and then just mix it all together. Okay. So this culture has been rocking and rolling since 122. All right. And it's the air. It's the so, drier springtails. Quick question. Hmm. Um. So I don't know how you feel about this, but personally, I really like to put uh, charcoal underneath my water dish, especially in the arid setups, to yep. give the springtails a place to, to hide, hide. Yep. and a place where they will always have a refuge. So you said that you like to uh, determine where the water dish goes first. So well, where Mariah, should we put that? Where do you want to put the water dish? I Near think the front. I think like right here. Perfect. Yep. Kay. Let's do that. So All and right. then you can dump the bugs, the little critters All right, right there. Bugs. Here we go. Have fun. There's tons to munch. Oh my gosh, look at them boing around. Yep. There's tons There's of so them in there. Many. Like, I'm like, is it dust or is it springtails? And now it's mostly the springtails. Look at them all. Yep. Be free. Like, it's a good thing I know there's you springtails. You are so gentle. Otherwise, I'd be like, oh my goodness, it's fleas. Yikes. I'm always <laughs> just like, don't. Okay, man, what, I, so, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of substrate and I'm going to cover the top just so that way. Um, there we go, we get a little bit of coverage. And then the water dish is gonna be right there. Now, I always show you guys this trick. So this is, doesn't really apply to the rosy bell, but if we get an extensive isopod population, or if you decide to use other cleaners, such as darkling beetles or things like that, you always inevitably run into the problem of them drowning in the water bowl. I take a small piece of cork like this, put it in the middle. It floats, crickets get in there, then climb out, hop out. Ice pods get in and then climb on here and stay on here until you as a keeper are like, oh, you can't be in there. Pull them out. It's just another, it's just another way to keep their water clean. And cork naturally produces tannins, which tannins, you know, like this tannin we use for tea. So it's kind of like a it will help, it can help keep the water a little healthier for slightly longer, I guess is the best way to put it. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so we so we got our biodegradables in here. We got our springtails, our isopods, our bi biological driver, our water bowl. Now, what I think we should figure out is where do we want our dens to be? So right. we have some cork bark flats here. So you guys all know how I love to use flats in setups like this with putting them deep into the soil. So that way it creates an already established burrow for them. So do your magic. Honestly. All right, so I'm thinking uh, definitely one on the cool end of the enclosure. Personally, I like to build from the left to the right. So heat on the left and then cool area on the right. Okay. This is a smaller enclosure, so that's a little bit trickier, but we're still going to have that heat in this corner, I'm okay. thinking. So let's stick one all the way over here. We'll just create a den area. You know, like a little cave, maybe, where she can hang out. Yep. And it would be nice if we can be able to put stuff right behind it or however that we want to do it. Yeah. And then I'm thinking another one, maybe closer to the front, closer to the front, yep. closer to the hot spot. So we're creating a warmer hive. Oh, that looks great. And that way she can thermoregulate. Um, yeah. And these are going to be more humid areas since they're directly in contact with the soil. So she can choose from warm, humid or yep. uh, cool, humid. The thing to keep in mind is a lot of people really freak out about oh my goodness, like my humidity is not high enough on my hot end and what am I going to do? Like nothing I'm doing is working. And yep. like, guys, calm down. Heat and humidity naturally have an inverse relationship. Where there's heat, it's going to dry out. Where, And where it's cool, it's going to be more humid. That's just how these things, humid air sinks, warm air rises, and there's this constant flux going on. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to recreate the natural conditions of the animal's environment in a very fixed amount of space. Yep. So offering all of those levels 
um, and those opportunities will enable beneficial. the animal to thermoregulate. Um, I don't know if this is the word hygroregulate, so regulate its own moisture and humidity, mm -hmm. um, and photoregulate, as we can get into later with UVB. Yep, the photo period mm -hmm. and all that good stuff. Let them do what's good for them. Yep, and, and so and if you're like, okay, I created these dens, but I, the humidity just isn't where I want it to be. So a couple things you can do. You can take some of your extra spag moss like this and you can take it and you can just stuff it in here in the base like this. Nice cozy mossy bed. And then put a little bit of substrate on top of it so that way the substrate is gonna be drier. So that way that isn't always wet. And that's just, it just is another option for you. You don't have to do that, but you know, I just wanted to give to show you guys that's something you can do. So now we have our, we have two different burrows established. I dig it. So next you mentioned about maybe putting this in the background yeah let's get that going so, i think you picked it? just the right size okay all right do you do you do you want me to do the honors or do you want to do the honors go for it all right it might take a little bit of rearranging but so, yeah that should work Little how did you how did you find that perfect piece just to go in there? So magic. Do, do we have to be con so if she gets out if she gets back behind here? We know this is inevitably inevitably gonna happen. There's a one and a half inch gap here behind, but it's in here nice and tight. Is this something that that us keepers need to be concerned about as far as making sure that she's okay, or are we gonna be cool with just kind of having that how it is? It can act as another cool hide. Okay. It's a nice tight squeeze. Yep. A lot of snakes like a tight squeeze. Yep. Um, so it's, I like that. That looks it's really not nice. Something to really worry about, okay. usually speaking. And honestly, we're going to be putting the bulb up here, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Then so she'll be able to get away, and mm -hmm. if the humidity rises in the back. Okay, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. If people don't want their snakes going behind, you can always use like a. A little bit of expanding foam, like yep. great stuff, to adhere the cork to the back. Yep. Um, just keep in mind that you'll have to do that with the enclosure on its back before you put the substrate in. Um, also, you can stuff more substrate behind the cork bark. Yep. Just know that isopods will tunnel through that and you will have to add more substrate yep. as it collapses. And if you don't properly silicone it all the way, it'll chew right through it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't silicone the base, then great stuff, the great stuff can detach from the glass over time. I can't wait to do that video, guys. It's coming in two weeks. Um, but anyway, all right, so we got we got this awesome piece of cork in here. We got the two burrows of water dish. We got some rocks. Do we want to grow rocks, plants? What's next step for us here? Okay, so this is where it gets tricky, and I think it's just going to take some uh, trial and error because I want to use plants for sure, but I also don't want to crush them accidentally. So I think we should put some rocks in first and leave some space so, for some plants. So if you come to the Biodude Houston, I don't mm -hmm. ship rocks yet, guys. I have not figured out a way to have it be affordable. Seriously. Because I sell it by the pound. So I have dragon stone, bone stone. I mean, let me show you guys. If you come over to the Biodude Houston, we have dragon stone, bone stone, thousand layer rock, mountain stone, wood stone, black river rock where your paludarium builds, and the snowflake rock, which is really, really cool. I mean, we got a bunch of different options, and I'm going to start using, you know, minerals and a lot more of my builds, so I'm pretty excited for that. Rock has a lot of really great... Uh, thermal properties. Yes, in the especially for creating basking spots. Mm -hmm. Which I can't wait for the Aki's monitor video. Oh, oh yeah, that's good. I be have great. I have mineral I have these giant pieces set aside specifically mm -hmm. for it. So I see we're kind of putting some stuff in yeah. here. So something I usually do to kind of help protect the plants and offer create a little bit more flexibility is I'll put the plants in their pots first and just kind of visualize a little bit, you know, where a plant might look good. Um, and that helps too with plant or with uh, rock placement and just build around it, but nothing too permanent. And then just kind of memorize where they go and work from there. Um, and we've got so many fun plants to choose from. I always have a lot of fun plants. Oh, I really like this. Is this an aloe? It's got a Christmas aloe. Look how pretty it is. It's mm -hmm. pink. Yep. I love this. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay. Usually, you don't want to do like groups of two. We don't have a ton of room in this enclosure, so we got to be really smart with our space. I really like this big plant here, but 
At the same time, I kind of want a rock stack right there. Yep. So, gee. That's what I was thinking. There is a lot of, like, mm, I don't know. You can put, I don't know. A succulent is not going to be happy by the water dish, most likely. Okay, we will feel it out. I don't know. What do you think about this? I think that one should be right there because the, really because the heat right bulb is going to be up here. Mm -hmm. We stack rocks up around it from behind. Okay, right. so should we just plant it there then? Yeah, let's do it. So let me get this so that way we can take that little pot. All right. Now here's a question. Uh, do you do anything for the roots of your plants to make sure that they're not contaminated? Okay, so, I, so when I... One thing that was one of my hardest growing pain challenges was to get my plants from a reputable grower. And so it is almost impossible to find a grower that doesn't use any sort of growing agents. Sure. However, you can find growers that go it the natural way or the aqua aquaponic way or mm -hmm. by just using other methods that don't always require a ton of different inorganic materials which a lot of times things like this will use. So I, I always recommend that the plants are completely like the, like the, like the uh, roots and everything. You wanna make sure that, that when you plant them, mm -hmm. that it is bare root. And when you buy plants from me, they're almost always going to be completely bare root. Okay, some of these leaves give a little bit of nutrition there. Something I like to do is I'll stick them under a hose and I'll just hose off the roots. And then that gets yep. nice and clean helps rinse off the leaves. And that's so. gonna grow up nice and tall. It's gonna look really good. Yeah. And you can break this plant up into pieces as you can clearly see. Oh yeah, it's got several buds. Yep. So. Perfect. Okay. And that will be I fun. dig it. Right. Oh, that is just a really great plant. Mm -hmm. All right, now All right. let's, I vote we rock and roll with some of this. Yeah. So we got some dragon stone right here. Mm -hmm. I was uh, thinking the dragonstone would look really good with this particular rosaboa. I agree. I actually had people, uh, was it was it you, Christina, that I had? Uh, I got your name I, right. Is it is Christina? Yep. Phew, okay, I was like, it's Christina or Katrina? I can't remember. I'm <laughs> testing some things, Mariah. Um, I do not mind. Yeah, me. go for it. I, I had her, was it you or someone else? Uh, bring the snake over to the rocks and like compare the colors and be like, okay, what would look best? Because, I don't know, that's something I like to do, is make sure that the enclosure is good for pictures. Because Reptifiles is an Instagram, and so making sure that things are Instagrammable is unfortunately very important in my design. So, this time Oh, yeah! Yeah! I dig that. That is so cool. So there's so, so there's so many... If source, like, right there, yeah. it'll be at so the highest point. There's so many crevices here, so... Let me remove this real quick so you guys can see. What I did was I put a higher one here that's actually sitting on top of this cork flat, mm -hmm. a shorter one here. So not so we're gonna have a different temperature gradient here, a different temperature gradient here, a different temperature humidity gradient in here, and then your nice hot basting spot that that snake is gonna love mm -hmm. right there. Right now, there. to me, we want it to also, I like to provide things that they might be able to, I hate saying the word climb, but potentially use in that sense. So climb is a perfectly fine so, word. So, you know, we also have some grapevine, got some ghost wood. Is there any of those that interest you? Do you want to use more? I rock? actually brought some of those over. Oh, so. okay. Well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's see here. What, yeah, what else you got there. rocking there? Yeah, cause okay. Rocks are going to be really important for housing a rosy boa because that's what they do in the wild is they love rocky areas. I'm trying to figure out because this is not the prettiest side of this rock. It's this one I want to put on display, but it's got a shape that's kind of funky. So maybe I'll put it somewhere else and try a different rock. But um, like right there maybe in a way that it won't shift. Oh, I kind of like that. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And then... We have a really neat elephant feed plant. Ooh. Put that bad boy right oh, there. Oh, that would look really good there. I really like the, the texture contrast with the other plants. So let's do that. Let's just stick that right there. I mean, right if, if, right if, if, if that's what, what you're digging. I mean, I, 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 I love the rock look right now. Mm -hmm. I think that looks outstanding. Rocks are great, but let's be honest, the green of the plants really makes things pop and it helps create the yep. humid microclimate that we're going for. And it makes the cleanup crew happy. Yep. So 
we want that's that true the, sure. the 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 isopods are going to lose their minds from the cork and all the rock and all the good stuff in there mm -hmm. oh yeah they i cannot keep them off my plants I just like i feed them squash yep. I'm like eat the squash stay out of my plants because again those powder oranges they breed so aggressively yep. it's it's hard to keep up with them once they really get going I really do. This is shaping up to be really nice. Mm -hmm. This is looking great. This is going to be such a happy, spoiled little rosy boa. Yep. I mean, depending on how big it grows, it might need an upgrade later in life. We'll see. They usually don't grow much past 24 inches usually. So this is a good size. That's a pretty good size. And honestly, and if you do want to upgrade, you know, we always recommend bigger is better. Mm -hmm. But it'd be really easy to take all this stuff out and use it to jumpstart your next enclosure. Oh, yeah. Then you're not you know, working yeah. from... You know, we're not starting from scratch all over, over again. again and you'll already have your springtails your isopods your archaea your mycorrhizal and all of your other organic biological processes already jump started and, and you know plus. and you know as this terrarium progresses if you decided to keep mm -hmm. it if you want to decide to you know really give your plants a boost to continually to help re-energize your soil you can use my biovive which will help put in those essential lost nutrients that your isopods are going to take away such as calcium phosphorus other things like that that are really important to the overall well-being mm. of the ecosystem. I'm really glad that you developed. Oh, look at that wonderful mold. Oh, that's neat. Interesting. Sweet. All right. Well, we got a snack for the isopods then. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Well, not so the isopods, the springtails. The springtails, yeah. Well, where there's mold, there's almost always isopods though, because they're kind of found in the same that's true. area of the floor. Woohoo! All right, we got nice healthy roots right here. A little bit of decaying plant matter at the bottom. That's perfectly natural for so, succulents. As far as feeding this little critter, this beautiful little snake is eating is currently eating a frozen thawed fuzzy. That's like a large fuzzy right now. Okay. Um, and we're doing that about once a week. So when we become adults, you know, um, we're going to be obviously taking a prey item that is. Uh, the general rule of thumb is the prey item should be, at least how I was taught, is about 10% thicker than the thickest part of the snake. So that way the snake gets bulge. It's better to feed the snake one large meal than numerous smaller meals. Look around here. The back makes really, makes I really, sure like, I really like how that looks. Yeah. That looks outstanding. I think if we get some sort of branch from here coming down. Ooh. And then maybe this one because it's got a really nice natural like little yep. hook to it, so yep. that might be perfect. Maybe or it's too small, just a touch. Okay, let's try something else. I couldn't find a piece as much bigger than this the ghost would. It's so pretty. Let, let me see what I can Let's do. see. Yeah. So another note about uh, diet with these snakes is. Uh, they're small, but you can still feed them fairly infrequently. So when they're young and growing, oh yes, look at this. Oh, that's gorgeous. I love it. Just stick it in this way maybe. You, you can't go wrong with a nice piece of wood. So true. I have a hoard of branches at home and it's okay. And rocks too. I just have too much of this stuff. Uh, Cause it's so nice to just have a large selection to choose from. And you can really find that perfect piece. Let's see, maybe we can, let's try turning it around maybe and seeing how it fits that way. Can I try something? Go for it. Ooh, okay. Ooh, yes. Yes, perfect. That's awesome. This here, and then I vote we just put one more small plant, if you want it. Or do you want to have it be a little bit more open? I like the openness look mm -hmm. at it because their biome is open and flat and there's all their shrubs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know. I'm definitely hesitant to add more plants. Um, yeah. As a landscaping role, you tend to want to do odd numbers of plants rather than even numbers. For some reason, it's more aesthetically pleasing. Interesting. So sticking with I mean, we're already kind of seeing it because this looks like two plants over here, but yep. it's still one area of visual interest. Uh, I mean, I really like how this turned out. Mm -hmm. I think this looks really it great. It definitely needs something here, though. Maybe like some small rocks? But, or... <gasps> or we can add more rocks to, this, to the pile, create more crevices for her to explore. I know you love that word, Josh. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. 
The Done. rock stack idea is something that I got from John Courtney Smith at Arcadia mm -hmm. Reptile. He's a huge believer in the power of rock stacks in an enclosure. Yep. I think that's yeah. amazing. So I think the next best thing, the next thing to do is let me go grab this little this little one. I'm gonna put her in here and we and we'll get a nice capture of her exploring her new digs. And then we're just gonna talk about what we're gonna be doing for her overall husbandry on the daily and then what type of heating apparatuses and lighting apparatuses that we're using. So we got Leo's little Rosie right here. Oh my goodness. You're about to be so excited. Too freaking cute. Okay, I'm just gonna put you. Explore. Oh, see, yeah, Dragonstone was perfect. Look how beautiful it is. Yeah, it's like, oh wow, I love it. So as far as lighting is concerned, we are using my BioDude 16 inch Glowing Bro, uh, as well using my LED props. We're gonna be running this light for about 10 hours a day uh, as well. We are going to be providing heat and UVB. UVB for a snake, I said it. So the first, as far as the lighting is concerned, we are going to be going with this 75 watt basking spot lamp that's going to be going right here in this uh, Exoterra glow lamp fixture. Uh, the, and then we're gonna be regulating or checking the humidity and the temperature with my thermometer hygrometer. And what's nice about this is this has a, a long probe. I think that's, a, it's, you know, it's pretty decent. So you can put the probe anywhere you want in the terrarium. You can put it right on top of the basking spot. You can put it deep down here into the burrow to see what the humidity is. Does it have it, one probe or two? It, it only has one. Okay. I'm trying to get one with two, it takes time. <laughs> Totally. Well, that's great because you can uh, have it monitor the hum the temperature and humidity in, uh, like, say, the cool hide. And so you know that the cool area is not going to get too dry, she not going beautiful. to get too, uh, uh, too warm. Yep. So that's very important, monitoring the cool end of the enclosure. Then for the warm end enclosure, which can tend to be a little bit more dynamic, I like using an infrared uh, temperature uh, like a temp gun. Yeah, to make yep. sure, because that's going to measure your surface temperature, what temperature is the rot getting to. That's often the temperature that's taken by um, by herpers and herpetologists in the field when they find an animal. They're like, okay, what like is the basking. surface temperature of the surface that yep. it's basking on right now? So that can help you compare your data yep. uh, with readings from the wild. And then as far as the UVB goes, so Mariah and I talked pretty deep in, into about this. So in the wild, uh, these guys are active mainly at dusk and dawn. So tell us a little bit about that. All right, so they're crepuscular, which means that they are mostly going to be active around dusk and dawn, so uh, sunset and sunrise, uh, which means they don't get a lot of sun. Because of this habit, a lot of people think, oh, well, we don't need to really replicate the sun in their environment. We can take that out as a factor. No, dusk and dawn is not the same as night. The sun is still present there. And that means there are going to be low levels of UVB as well that we need to keep, uh, keep in mind. And as far as we can tell, we haven't found a species yet that, uh, or rather a reptile that does not yeah, utilize yeah. UVB uh, to uh, synthesize its own vitamin D, even with carnivores that eat animals whole that get their most of their vitamin D from their prey. Um, it's still an important part of making sure that they are getting everything that they need because you can't just rely on your feeders and hope that they have the right amount of nutrients that your snake needs. Providing UVB can help fill in those blanks. It also provides a host of other benefits. It's not just about vitamin D. It's also um, exposure to UVB encourages the production of serotonin, which is a feel-good hormone that reptiles experience as well as humans. So you go outside, you feel the sun hit your skin, you're just like, oh, yes. At least I experienced that. I don't know about you guys. That's UVB hitting your skin, encouraging serotonin production as well as that warmth, that bright light. It all works in as well as um, you're looking at stimulation of healthy digestion, you're looking at mental health for the animal, making sure that it's feeling well enough mentally to act like a snake should, should act rather than just sitting and hiding and, you know, I don't know, experience the snake version of depression, I don't know. But it's a lot more than just vitamin D. Yeah. So people oversimplify it and we really don't know everything that the that the sun does for reptiles. So we can just hope to replicate as best as we can in their environment with heat 
light, visible light and UVB, yeah. and hope that we are doing a good enough job to replicate those benefits for them in captivity. Yeah. And, and we're rocking and rolling with the Arcadia Shade Dweller 7%. Mm -hmm. It's honestly, this is probably the best form of a market as far as we're dealing with these types of animals that there is. Uh, yeah, these bulbs, really well for they're species. rated for one year T5. So Mariah and I are going to be doing a video here soon about more, a little bit in depth about UVB, how to measure it, uh, how long bulbs last, proper fixtures, and other things that all reptile keepers need to know, which we're really excited for. Again, so what we have in here, we have a full, fully functional ecosystem that's going to be rocking and rolling here. She already went and made her tunnel right down here underneath. So mm -hmm. Lord only knows where she went now. However, I'm really happy with how this turned out. I think, I think, I think it's beautiful. I love the look of the rock, and I think we did a really good job replicating her environment to the best of our ability. Totally. Um, is there anything else that, that that you would like my viewers to know about about Little Rosie, about what makes her so special as a snake? Well. So one of my favorite things, since I don't research one species of snake or one species of reptile, I research multiple species. She's 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 gone. She's is she under the? No, she's dish? she's went and burrowed all the way down already. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that, Tiffany, your 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 snake's gonna be in the cage. <laughs> she's in there. <laughs> yeah, just be careful it doesn't shift during. Yeah, the I know. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, tell, I'll move stuff around so that way. It but uh, yeah, so Rosie Bows, uh, or getting back to what I was saying earlier. So one of my favorite things about researching multiple different species, rather than just focusing in on one, is I get the holistic perspective. Um, kind of a, a, a top view rather than zooming in on only one part of the total reptile picture. And part of that is I get to see similarities between species. And there are a lot of reptiles that look very similar and because they have similar ecological niches in their area. The difference is they live in totally different areas of the world. There's no way that they can possibly be related. So for rosy boas, they're extremely similar to African sand boas. Uh, they both have really smooth scales. They're both fairly small. They've got that uh, chunky sausage-like body. The rosy boa is going to be slimmer than uh, the Kenyan sand boa, but you get where I'm going with this. Um, and they both kind of have a slightly more blunt shape of a head, very much a burrowing type of snake yep. that is uh, built to not only make burrows, but to do it very well. Those smooth scales enable passing through substrate and soil very well. Um, and yeah, just similar ecological niche, which is really cool. And if you compare their habitats, their habitats are also very much the same, which helps with that. Um, something I really like about uh, this approach for a burrowing species is it's nice and loose substrate. And then we added the leaves and the sphag of moss to make sure that the substrate would stay loose. And the isopods help maintain that, as well as other cleanup crew bugs. And what that does is it makes it easier for the snake to burrow. It's not going to pack down. It's going to stay loose and fluffy and easy for the snake to dig through without hurting itself. And with the, with the Sahara raining, retaining all the tunnels and burrows, you, sometimes you get lucky and you have the outside of the enclosure here and you can physically see the burrows they make. And that's the coolest thing is to see a burrow that goes down like this at the very bottom and they can literally hold that entire thing keeping your snake, mm -hmm. you know, happy and healthy. But the reptile. Yep. And again, guys, really, really appreciate the support. Really hope you enjoyed the videos. I loved having you here, Mariah. It was so much fun. It was a blast. Yeah. I'm so glad to have been here. Yeah. And all right, guys, thank you so much. The dude abides. <laughs>